Then, let's get our hearts and minds ready to worship the Lord. Kayla's going to bring us into the presence of the Lord with some music. Just to ask you to open up your hearts and minds to what the Lord wants to say to you today. Bread. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have been bondage to sin and we cannot forgive ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, and more walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a call to an ordained minister of Lutheran congregations and mission for Christ, and by God's authority, and therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our next hymn is uh, day by day, still working on the blue hymnal yet, number 746, 746.
Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya and Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark, and the moon will turn blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord rise. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Please rise as you're able for the gospel. chapter 16. Jesus says this, But I will send you the Advocate, the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testif testify about me because you have been born, been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Now we're going to go to chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 4. Yes, Still Jesus saying this. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. I didn't tell you earlier because I was going to be with you a while longer. But now I am going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of Truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own, but will tell you about what He has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever He receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever He receives from me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
Please be seated. Today, as we, as we celebrate Pentecost Sunday, we uh, notice that we uh, got a lot of red up here. And in the, Pen in the Christian church, Pentecost is the 50th day after Easter, if we count both Easter and the day of Pentecost. And the day we celebrate as Pentecost today takes the place of the Jewish feast of Pentecost, which took place 50 days after the Passover feast was celebrated. Now, the festival of, of Pentecost in the Old Testament was called the Shabbat, and that was celebrated as a thankfulness of the first fruits of the harvest. Also, the Feast of Pentecost celebrated the covenant established between God and his people by giving the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, the book of Acts tells us about the original Pentecost as well in our second lesson reading today from Acts chapter 2. Jews from all over were gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Shavuot, the Jewish feast. And on that Sunday, talked about in the book of Acts, ten days after Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples were gathered in the upper room, again, where they had seen Jesus after his resurrection. But Jesus had promised his disciples that he would send his Holy Spirit. And on Pentecost, they were then blessed with the gift of the Spirit. Let's take a look again at the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. On the day of Pentecost, all believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then, what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. The disciples began to preach the gospel in all of the languages that the Jews who were gathered there spoke. And we're talking about 3,000 people converted and baptized on that day. So, the red color is to signify the power and the promise of the Holy Spirit, a Holy Spirit fire, to all believers who believe in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And it was on this day, in the descent of the Holy Spirit, a new covenant between God and his people was established. This new covenant is that Jesus would always be with those who believe in him through the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And this covenant of the Holy Spirit sent from God is for the sole purpose of helping us. Now, this holy helper is in fact God himself and carries all of the same divine characteristics within him. So, what kind of help does the Holy Spirit do for us? Now, our scripture passage for today tells us about two purposes of the Holy Spirit. The first purpose of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction. While we tend to think of the Holy Spirit working in the lives of believers, the first work of the Holy Spirit was actually in the lives of unbelievers, or people who have not yet understood what Jesus is all about. Jesus speaks of, in verses 8 through 11, in our Gospel text for today, these words, And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin, and of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. 
judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin and convince people of the righteousness of Jesus and also God's judgment. Now this word convict comes from the Greek word edical, which means to expose and to convict with a compelling evidence. Now the word is actually a legal term used in courts of law, and it's, it's used by a prosecuting attorney to show the guilt of a person on trial. in our hearts and and it works in our minds as well to convict us of our sinfulness and we need to be convinced of this because apart from God's grace all of us are convinced of our absolute goodness just ask anyone are you a good person statistics show that 90% of people will say that they are very good people. Now, if you ask your child who's responsible for the broken lamp, they're going to say, not me. Now, this means you have a villain running around your house named not me. If you ask a woman how she stubbed her toe, she will say that she walked into a chair. If you ask a man the same question, he will say that some idiot put a chair in his way. All of us are convinced of our own inward goodness. So it's the work of the Holy Spirit to show us that we are, in fact, uh, not really that good. Now, if your standard for comparison is Hitler or Saddam Hussein, yeah, you're looking pretty good. However, what if your standard of comparison is Mother Teresa or Jesus himself, how good are we then? So, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 reminds us of how good we really are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So then, if nobody's perfect, how could we ever possibly be good enough? And that's what the Holy Spirit convicts us of. We're, we're not good enough. And there's nothing that we can do by ourselves to be good enough to be saved. This is the first purpose of the Holy Spirit, to convict us of our inability to save ourselves on our own. We need divine help. And this is the big difference between the Holy Spirit and the devil. The Holy Spirit convicts us and then builds us up within that conviction. The devil condemns us and then proceeds to tear us down physically, mentally, and spiritually. With the Holy Spirit, there is hope. With the devil, there is only despair. So this brings us to the second purpose of the Holy Spirit in our scripture passage, and that is to convince people of the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus says this in verses 8 through 10, And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father. Now the phrase, this phrase means that we can only be right with God as a result of our sinfulness and that God's going to be the only one who can provide that way for us. The Greek word for righteousness is the word adekakulosune which means one who has the authority to justify, give freedom, and to declare someone to be righteous. And the only way to be righteous in God's eyes 
is through his son Jesus. Jesus stated himself in the Gospel of John, the chapter right before readings today, John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. <coughs> A week from tomorrow is Memorial Day. And on this day, we celebrate the freedoms that we have. And the reason that we have these freedoms is because of people who put their lives on the line and gave their lives for us. In every war, people gave their lives and sacrificed their lives for us. In a sense, they became our substitute. They took our places and offered themselves for us. And as a result, we can live in this free nation and enjoy our freedoms. And it's hard to connect with this because you may not have seen the people who did this for you. You may not know the many people who gave their lives and, and are still giving their lives for our freedom. Yet their accomplishment is still very, very real. Just go out to the cemetery on Memorial Day and see the grave markers with all of the flags on them. You'll then realize the cost of our freedom was very, very real. And the same thing is true spiritually. We can enjoy the fruit of the Holy Spirit in God's spiritual indwelling within us. We can know that we are forgiven, and that when we die, we will be in God's presence because of a battle that happened a long time ago. When Jesus died on the cross, taking all of our sins upon himself, he became the sacrifice that won the war against Satan and the powers of darkness. God takes the perfect righteousness of Jesus and because of his sacrifice on our behalf, God then places that same righteousness on all who believe in the saving grace of his Son. God took our sinfulness and placed it on Jesus so that by his one sacrifice, he paid the penalty for all of our sins and enabled us to live a free life from the bondage of sin. Back to Romans chapter 3 again. This time we're going to look at the verses just previous to our last one in verses 20 through 22. And it explains about this truth. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now, God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Just as the blood of servicemen and women paid for our freedom, so the blood of Jesus paid for our spiritual salvation. Now, after the Holy Spirit gives conviction and convinces a person of the truth of Jesus and all that he has accomplished for us, verse 13 from our Gospel text then says that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. And the truth spoken of here is that of what Jesus taught and said. Let's take a look again at the Gospel previous to our gospel, to, or the uh, chapter previous to our gospel text today, in John chapter 14, verse 26, and Jesus says this, But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. Folks, the Holy Spirit will guide you. It's a promise from Jesus himself. It's in red, see? Now here's something we need to understand. 
the verb tense used here in the Greek language indicates that this is a present and ongoing process. This means that the Holy Spirit will guide us and will continue to guide us. And this guidance of the Holy Spirit is not just a one-time thing, but rather is a lifetime experience. Now, the disciples were definitely having a hard time understanding this because for over three years, they had been physically with Jesus and looking to him for help during that time. And yet, in verse 7 from our gospel text for today, Jesus says, but in fact, it's best for you that I go away. And the disciples were having a lot of difficulty in believing that. They were thinking this is definitely not a good thing. And the disciples couldn't understand how they could possibly do the things Jesus called them to do without his physical presence among them. Still, back in John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus had given them this promise when he says this, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Scripture tells us that after Jesus' death and subsequently through the work of the Holy Spirit, over 100,000 people came to know Jesus through the work, direct work of the disciples. The gospel went not only to the towns of Israel, but to Spain, Ethiopia, Rome, and India. And over the last 2,000 years, it has gone to every tribe, nation, and tongue upon the earth. Without Jesus physically being there to do it. Now this tells me that we can do a whole lot more than we think we can. And that all the help we need is what God supplies through the work of his Holy Spirit. Now, there are many things in which you can do. However, you may be thinking like the disciples did. I, I, I can't possibly do that. However, you can with the help of the Holy Spirit. Nothing is impossible with God's help through his Holy Spirit. Jesus promises that exact thing in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Jesus says this, Humanly speaking, it is impossible. But with God, everything is possible. Trust yourself. Trust God. And trust the Holy Spirit. You're going to be amazed at what you can do under His influence. If we look at the work and the purpose of the Holy Spirit, we realize that it is He who does all the saving, all the guiding, and all the strengthening. <clears throat> However, there is a role and function that all of us have. You and I need to plant and water the seeds of truth and salvation for people. And yet it's God who produces the harvest. The same is true for, for me speaking the word of God up here. I can exegete all the words of the Greek and Hebrew that I want. But unless it's the Holy Spirit working through me, everything's going to go flat and should. The same holds true for the Holy Spirit working in your hearts. He's going to work through your minds as you listen to these words that are spoken to. This third person of the Trinity, who is equally God and with all his divine powers, is here to help us. And the Holy Spirit does this by convicting and convincing us. Then supplies us with all the help we need to do the work God has called each of us to do. And that's why we celebrate Pentecost. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to 
Convict us of our sins that separates us from you and to convince us the need of the same saving grace that is available through believing in what your son Jesus accomplished on the cross to win the war against Satan, all his evil and the power of death. Thank you, Lord. Help us, Lord, and give us strength through your Holy Spirit to plant and water the seeds of your gospel truth to everyone around us. And we pray this through the holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is a classic, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Still working on the blue hymnal yet number 771, 771.
He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, we pray for this church as we, as we move forward with uh, uh, this Pentecost Sunday with the Holy Spirit and finding each of us to uh, carry that message of your gospel truth out the front doors into our mission field. Lord God, protect everyone who's in this church from any kind of physical and spiritual uh, dangers, Lord. And uh, Father God, we also pray. For Christ the Victor Church in Florence, Arizona, as they proclaim your truth through Arizona and beyond, Lord, we just ask you to descend upon their church as well. Give them an inspiration of the Holy Spirit, ignite them, Lord, protect them from any kind of human evil and the darts of Satan. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for your continued healing among this congregation, Lord God. We, we thank you for the healing that you've already done within this congregation, Lord, and we just see you constantly moving with your healing all the time. Lord God, we ask you to send your Jehovah Rapha down to all those people on our minds in need of your healing touch at this time, whether that's in body, mind, or spirit. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Lord God, we ask you to heal this nation. We, we know the only way that's going to happen is through you, Lord. We ask for your love to descend on each one of us so that we can show that love to others. We can start that process of healing and that uh, reconciliation. Lord God, you promised us in your holy word in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14, that if we turn from our wicked ways, you will hear our prayers and you will heal this land. Stand in that promise. Well, we got to turn from our wicked ways. And we got to pray for this nation. So, Lord, we as a congregation promise to pray for this nation's leaders and this healing of this nation. To, hear, to pray for our leaders from our president all the way down to our city councils. Lord God, protect them, keep them safe. Guide them, Lord, with your intercession as to your will. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear Lord, our Lord, prayer. Lord God, as we come up on Memorial Weekend next week, Lord, we pray for our soul. Keep them safe wherever they are at in the world, putting their lives on the line for us. Lord God, bring them home. Reunite them with the families. Then remind us we need to stand by them as they stood by for us. We need to supply them with jobs that they need to, to come back into society. We need to supply them with, with any kind of healing that they need, whether that's in body, mind, or spirit. Lord God, remind us as a nation that they we can enjoy our freedoms because of the lives they are putting in the line for us. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, there's people putting their lives on the line right in our own communities. Law enforcement, fire department, ambulance personnel, emergency room personnel at hospital, Lord. They're putting their lives on the line for us, Lord, so we're asking you to protect them. Keep them safe on their ships from any kind of physical danger, uh, mental danger, as they get tired doing everything that they do day after day. Remind us every time we hear a siren, we've got to pray for the officers responding and for the situation they're responding to. Lord, protect them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we also pray for all those soldiers that are fighting on the front lines for your gospel truth. All those missionaries that we support individually and as a congregation, protect them, Lord. Keep them safe from any kind of human evil and any kind of evil of Satan. Lord, protect them on their travels. Protect their health and the health of their families. And Lord, please provide them with the resources they need to do those ministries you've called them to. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. If there's anyone who has any prayers that would like to make at this time, please go ahead and say them. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commit all for whom we pray. Trusting in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
And you can share the piece with each other as you go out the door, shoulder bumps, eyes, whatever it's such too. Uh, we'll continue to take our offering in the basket that's placed on the chair, right in the back of Amanda back there. And uh, anyone who's watching us online that would supply towards the ministry here at Faith Lutheran Mission Church, address is on the screen, write out a check to us, and we promise it will go towards building God's kingdom, not only here in the city, but to the continents. Oh, well, you're all standing. You look like you're ready to sing again. How about we sing the Lord's Prayer? Sure. You got it. How about we sing the Lord's Prayer? Yeah! yeah. Much better.
Thanks be to God.